All right, hello everybody, what's up? Welcome to Comic Book Radio, coming at you today at 1 o'clock Eastern. You can see the sun's coming through the window. It's not as dark as it usually is here in the studio. Studio. This is episode 179. My guest today is Russ Leach. Russ Leach. Man, comic book black belt. Had a great conversation with Russ the last time he was on the show. And uh, I'm happy to say that Russ is going to be drawing King Cryptid number 12. That's going to be fun. What will that be about? Uh, You'll see. We'll talk maybe a little bit about that later. But I really want to talk to him today about sword and sorcery. He's got a campaign right now going for the Shadow Kingdom. It's on Fun My Comic. Go check that out. The link is in the description of the show. But don't do it right now. After the show. After. Before we bring Russ on, I want to say hello to those of you in the chat. We got Chuck here. Chuck. Chuck is excited for CBR, for Comic Book Radio today. Happy Friday to you indeed, Chuck. And I salute you as well. Hope you're doing well, Chuck. Thank you for being here. Uh, Ben, what's up, Ben? Hope you're doing good. Happy Friday. Everybody looking forward to the weekend? You guys got something big planned for the weekend? I... I kind of do. I mean, we've got the Alterna Art Auction on Saturday and Sunday. Those are always fun. At 9 o'clock, they start at, uh, at Eastern Time at, night o'clock, at 9 o'clock. At, uh, and it, uh, it goes like, like three, 3 hours, maybe. <laughs> so we usually go 9 to midnight. By midnight, it's like, oh, hey, this is $45 starting. <laughs> Everyone's tired, but it's fun. It's a fun time. Hopefully, you guys are going to have a great weekend. Hopefully, you're all having a good Friday. Revan Saber. What's up, Revan Saber? Afternoon to you. Russ is also in the chat as well as on the panel today. Creators Outlet. How's it going, Creators Outlet? Says, smash that like button and ring that bell. Thank you, Creators Outlet, for uh, giving me the reminder to give you the reminder. Brian Suddenly Old is here, too. What's up, Brian? Good morning to you, or afternoon, or wherever it is that you may be. Or evening, maybe. That's possible. I think it might be a little bit uh, evening-y where Russ is at. Well, you know, let's bring him on. Let's ask him. But without further ado, give a big comic book radio welcome. A welcome back. I got to get like a welcome back Cotter song thing going for return guests. To Mr. Russ Leach. What's up, Russ? Hi. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, good. Thank you. No problem. What time is it over there? It's five past five. Uh, oh, okay. Normally it would be five past six, but we 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 haven't gone to summertime yet, so uh, it's uh, a one hour difference of the difference, if you like. Oh, okay. And you guys, uh, you guys do daylight savings over there, or? Yeah, yeah, we do. Ours is at the end of uh, March. Yeah. Oh wow! Look so. at that. Like, they don't make it easy for everybody, huh? No, not at all. It's absolutely awful. You figure if they're going to have like a globalist regime, they should do something useful with it and agree on yeah. the time. Yeah. Well, no, nobody said they were organized. <laughs> <laughs> they just said they were in charge. <laughs> man, oh, man. Oh, man. That's, it's interesting to me because I, uh, I had Clayton Barnes, uh, uh, Clayton Barton on uh, a week or so ago. Right. And uh, I didn't know if he would have. Uh, yeah, he's tremendous. It was a great conversation. But I didn't know if he would have daylight savings either. And, uh, and uh-huh. he did. And, but because last time we got our yeah. time screwed up, but I love the, you know, the, the, the more daylight. Mm, yeah. 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 <laughs> Relatively like speaking. All the way around. I, I don't oh, see yeah. why they change it. It's rubbish. Yeah. If anything, I think when they uh, set the clocks back, put them forward one more hour and yeah. then leave it. Yeah. Just leave, leave it. it. Yeah. That'd be yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm good with that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Six o'clock sundown for winter, ten o'clock for summer. Hmm. That'd be great. Yeah, 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 over here during the summer, it can be nearly, you know, it could be like 11 o'clock before it gets dark. Wow. It's, uh, it's yeah. bonkers, yeah. But we're closer to the, uh, to the, um, nor- you know, the northern pole, north pole. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit weird. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get so, you. There you go. Oh, Pedro. Yeah, Hiya, Pedro. Good. Hey, Pedro. Hey, AL. Hey, Yan Zhao. What's up? All right. So, uh, I really want to talk to you today about Sword and Sorcery Fantasy mm -hmm. Adventure. Um, is that a, uh, a genre that's near and dear to you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, piles of Conan comics hanging about. Like this one. Old ones. Um, they, I loved them as a kid. Uh, I remember picking up um, Savage Sword of Conan. I could only have been about 10 years old when I had it, 9 or 10 years old, which you probably wouldn't be allowed to have now. Uh, but it, it just it made a big impact on me. John Buscema's work had a big impact on me. Oh, uh, yeah. That was a double hitter because he was doing... They were doing reprints of Fantastic Four with his, with Sinner inks over his work um, in Captain Britain. And then I was picking up Buscema in, in Conan comics as well. So, yeah. Yeah, made a, made a big impression on me as a kid. That the first time you saw Buscema's work? Uh, first time I recognised it as being the same person consistently would have been in Captain Britain on the Fantastic Forum, yeah. Wow. I didn't yeah. know his name at the time. You don't read the credits, oh, yeah. do you, when no. you're a kid? You just read the comics. But I could see what, what I really liked, what I loved about it. There's yeah. so much energy, beautiful stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's so much uh, in my collection over the years. I looked back one day when I was sorting through things, and I couldn't believe how many of the same kind of creators, especially artists mm. that I had, because I didn't really pay much attention to the credits when I was a kid. No, no And then looking through it, I'm like, oh, man, I got like ton of john byrne buscema romita yeah uh cockram on x-men you know a whole bunch just... of starlin as well uh, oh he, yeah yeah really you know he, i would say starlin and um like the fan a lot of the fantastic four stuff whether it would be kirby or buscema went mm. into only death can save us that that was probably where it all was you know cosmic stuff uh great sort of space fun but um yeah, the, the 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 sword and sorcery stuff, Buscema elevated it uh, above so many other people. Oh yeah, not uh, that so keen on Barry Windsor Smith on Conan, although I do love Barry Windsor Smith. I think he's Wolverine or Weapon X. Yeah, um, Barry Machine Windsor Man, Smith, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, stuff. there's stuff about his work I really love, and then there's other things I felt like it wasn't really the right choice for the artist on that. Yeah, but yeah, the. The Weapon X stuff. Oh, my Lord. It's, yeah, fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, so what is it about Sword and Sorcery in particular that you're drawn to? Um, the adventure aspect, um, especially now. Uh, I mean, there's... Entertainment in general tends to be filled with rubbish at the moment. <laughs> I turn the TV on, I turn it off. I don't bother with streaming anymore because... There's rubbish on there. I tend to go and pick up older films if I'm going to watch something. Yeah. Um, there are a few diamonds in the rough in corporate comics, but most of it is tripe, to be honest. It's not particularly well presented, and the stories are quite dull. Uh, you know, episodic serial content, pulp content in the comics, was what made comics so great, or what made superhero comics so great. And... Um, they, they've kind of lost that there's still you know indie work like yourself there's still great stuff out there um but sword and sorcery is it, it's kind of been in the background for a while there, there's obviously a few people doing it um but um uh, there's a there's a great book out uh crom by our uh the is it the fourth world i can't remember the, the channel it's rj i think his name is oh okay crom. yeah the the crom, fourth age the, fourth that, age, that channel it. yeah crom looks really good um and then you've got uh, jimmy rays um he's got some kind of sword and sorcery thing the art on that looked pretty yeah, amazing dragon rage right dragon rage that's it or dragon age dragon rage that's it dragon rage um he, he's a fantastic artist um so there are a few people doing it but not a huge amount and um i think sword and sorcery as a especially you know with it with it you know, being with Robert E. Howard being the font, really being the start of it, his prose was fantastic. His word smithery was just, you know, wonderful, to, wonderful to read. Yeah. Um, and it underpins this sort of adventure, uh, to somewhat, at some degree, a very masculine adventure, which I think we're kind of missing out on at the moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's time to bring it back, I think. 
Yeah, we really uh, seem to be at the moment in terms of storytelling. It, it, it For all the preaching of diversity, there seems to be a homogenization. <laughs> yes, everywhere, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all the same, it's rubbish. Um, yeah, I, I get fed up with the whole thing because you're not actually creating diversity at all. Uh, I worked with um, JD Rosario on Unstoppable Comics um, when I first started gigging um, you know, 2011, 2012 on, on indie work. And he's, I think he's Puerto Rican, I think. Um, and he just created fantastic diversity in his books without even trying. It, because he was about the stories and the characters. Yeah. And yes, he made a point of going and getting stuff from different cultures, but that was as a backstory to the characters. Um, it wasn't what made the characters the characters. And uh, he was doing diversity long before Marvel thought it was a good idea. Long before they thought it was a good marketing you know, idea. Yeah, marketing is the key. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Because it's, it's always just, been there. Yeah, 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 it's always been there. Exactly, right. And it's all just the same fluff. It's sort of rubbish. You just need something something a bit shocking who, who'd have thought that uh, uh my age i'd be punk rock I, I just didn't see that one coming so um i, I don't like i don't like mainstream stuff anymore yeah I call it mainstream well, i there's... think indie's mainstream to be honest with you corporate i corporate. don't like corporate stuff it's just yeah they're not they're not the characters or the publishers that i grew up loving as a kid put it that way. they're kind of getting directives from somewhere else at this point they must you know, be. Yeah. it feels like there's a lot of creators that are, are maybe wanting to do mm. something that feels deeper. But the directive is like, no, no, focus on the superficial. Don't give the plebiscite any ideas. <laughs> don't don't let them don't let them think they might be above their station. Don't give them any any imagination. Uh, I think it, you can't blame all of the creatives in, in no. corporate comics they're, they're doing what they do whether they're on their way through to Netflix or whether they actually love it or not I don't know um, but it, they're getting they're getting directions from their editors from their executives whatever and that's why indie's great because you can get on and do what you want to do absolutely yeah. yeah yeah 100% you know it's all about having the attitude and the mindset mm. and the stick to <laughs> Yeah. To be willing to accept there's going to be a lot of adversity. It's not going to be an easy path. It's going to be a lot of work. And it's not that it's not easy on the other side either. No, but, no, no, no. man, you'd rather work for what you want to do. Work for yourself. Exactly. And yeah. bring out something that means something, hopefully, yeah. a great deal to you. That's why your intro is so great. You've got those two clips. You've got the Bruce Lee clip, Be Like Water. And you've got the uh, Sly Stallone clip, which is just one of my favorite clips. All got time. it. Those are those, those are daily reminders for me every time I put yeah. on the show. Um, nail it. Yeah. Yeah, because it it really is the fact that uh, it, and there's there's also a quote, and Bruce Lee's also said it too, but many have said it throughout time about how you shouldn't pray for an easy life. You pray for the strength mm -hmm. to endure a difficult one. Yeah. You know, because yeah. it's not going to be, nothing's going to be easy. And especially if you want to try to achieve anything, it's going to be even more difficult. Mm. You're, you're literally going into the storm yeah. if you're trying to achieve something. Yeah. If it's easy, it probably isn't worth having. Yeah, so, absolutely. Go. And that's kind of, that ties in a bit too to the sword and sorcery and fantasy adventure yeah. aspects. Yeah. Now, I've noticed, I don't know if this is true to the genre, but I've noticed in most sword and sorcery, as opposed to what you see a lot of the time in superhero comics where the character, the protagonist, it, it's about an altruistic good. Um, the sword and sorcery genre, for the stories I've read and, and I'm familiar with, seems to be more about not necessarily altruistic good, of good for goodness sake, but doing good because it, out of like self-interest in a way. Yeah, you in know, some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conan was a bit like that. And it's yeah. it's relatable yeah, <laughs> on that level yeah. because you know a lot of the times like we have to we have to take care of ourselves because yeah. almost no one else is looking out for you you know and you try to do good based on that and then make the best decision possible I think yeah. that's why even though sword and sorcery seems like it's such a different time period it's you know in some cases it feels so much longer ago or maybe it is so long ago 
there's still something that resonates. Yeah, like with all mythologies, that's that's why that's why seeing superhero uh, comics take the dive that they have is so sad because they were a modern mythology. There's a there's a hero's journey. There's a there's right and wrong. There's morals in it. At the same time, there's stories about life. You know how you apply yourself to any kind of problem, whether that's a supervillain or a bully or whatever it might be. And that's why it's such a pity that that superhero comics are seeing that it's seeing themselves flag. And yeah, the sword and sorcery stuff, just like Lord of the Rings, it's like they're. They're these new mythologies for a new age after you've had things like Greek mythology, you know, and uh, all the way back into, you know, Abyssinia and, and Babylon and Sumerian or whatever. You, you, you've got these mythologies and you have these repeating um, tropes about the hero's journey, about doing the right thing. And, and along the way, how you might do it by accident, even, it, as you were pertaining to, it's like, you can get on the right side of Conan and, and he'll back you to the hilt, but you mess him about and he's just going to chop your head off. And it's that, it's that stuff. You, you don't get that in today's society, which is a good thing, okay? We shouldn't be going around chopping each other's head off. But there's plenty of people that like to abuse you without actually doing it to your face. Yeah. Um, and and that's, what, that's part of Sword and Sorcery. It's like it's this primeval kind of uh, interaction between people that, that you know you've got to behave yourself. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the metaphor yeah. there of the respect level needs to be kept intact. Mm, yes, yeah. you know? healthy respect. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and the the no the, the suffer no fools yeah. aspect. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I'm not one to suffer fools gladly. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, nowadays, probably. I find well, before I used to be a bit more confrontational with mm. the, the fools that I would uh, not suffer. Now I'm finding that. I see someone coming at me about something and I'm able to, and maybe it's because I've gone through so much of this over the years, yeah. but I'm more able to assess whether or not I should respond. And 90% of the time, I'm like, not even worth the time. Yeah. Cause bah. as soon as they take my time yeah. and my emotion and energy yeah. and you know, you get sucked into that, it turns into they've won. It doesn't even yeah. matter what the outcome is. They've won because no, they've, they've stolen won, yeah. time from me. They've taken time from you. Just ignore these idiots. You know, the 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 hangers on. Uh, nine times out of ten, people come out here out, out of jealousy. Um, they want what you've got, or they want they they in some way think that you have something they don't, um, and they'll they'll not like that. Um, in my view, you know, I mean, I I don't post political comment or cultural comment particularly. I post images that I really like. I, I post other people's artwork. I post my artwork. I post about projects that I think look really cool. I post yeah. about artists that I've loved in the past. Occasionally, I'll answer a, a question. I'll be very polite and respectful. And whoever comes at me, if they're polite and respectful, they'll get it back. Um, if you're in any way confrontational, I don't want to know. And if you can't say something nice, and just because you're able to criticize someone or give a critique doesn't mean you can't be polite about it. So if you haven't got something nice to say, then don't say anything at all. And I don't mean that as in don't be critical. I just mean be polite. Uh, that's, that's what my mother told me. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, like you mentioned, the, re the healthy respect. Healthy the, respect. The fact that, you know, you're talking to another human being who that's has right. not done you any wrong. They're just doing <laughs> what they're doing. Yeah, and if you're going to come at them full force, mm -hmm. you're going to get one of two things: you're going to get either ignored, or you're going to get someone coming back at you confrontationally. Very few people are, are masters of de-escalation, and uh, yeah. my hats off to them. I'm not going to yeah, take yeah, it well off, done. but my hats off to them. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. It's de impressive. De-escalation de is the way to go. You don't you want to get into rows with people. It's like you say, it completely uh, uh, wastes your energy. And in the sword and sorcery world, you need the energy to chop the bad guy's head off. You, you don't want to waste it on messing exactly. with some troll somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's a real troll and he's got a big club, then, of course, you've got to deal with it. So. That's, what I like. That's what I love about the metaphors of these stories because you, you, you do. You see these characters up against various things, various mm -hmm. adversity. You know, And that's what I think is so important to have uh, with these stories and to keep them around and to... To, to pass the torch and to carry on the tradition of this kind of storytelling because it does enable people 
to almost learn through a, a fictional simulation, you know, hmm. where where you you're, you're, you kind of get to test out adversity through the eyes of the fictional characters who've yeah. gone up against it. And, and that's why even I love history and biographies, because then you get to yeah. even encounter some realistic uh, portrayals of people that have gone through mm. actual events. But the fiction, which is so much fun and sometimes uh, is, is even more engaging, that is so important to be mm. able to communicate those ideas. And we need that around. Yeah, people need to read more books. They certainly need to read more comic books good comic books uh but yeah the, the written word uh lose yourself in that look get, get off your phone read a book get off your phone read a comic you know don't read a comic on the phone <laughs> read a comic read a book with it in your hands it's, uh... so are you not a fan of digital comics ah oh, you know they they are what they are they as if people are reading then what the hell i don't mind um i'm not personally impressed by it i i just like to have a book in my hands it's probably because i'm an old fart but yeah. <laughs> well i'm right there with you <laughs> um i'm i don't know i'm approaching old fart status i certainly <laughs> feel like an old fart i've been feeling like an old fart since <laughs> i was like 12 but uh you know in in some ways and then for forever young in other ways i am uh, but uh, let's see. Uh, Brian says, uh, Russ worked on Only Death Can Save Us. I got that book at a local con from an independent vendor wow. selling global independent books. Look at that. Good Lord. Good Lord. That's fantastic. Well done. Fantastic. And yeah, go to russleach.com. He's got yeah. all his stuff up on you there. You can pick those books up on Amazon at the moment. Um, and uh, there's it's potential that we might be serializing, as, serializing them as well through Arrow, through Diamond. Um and uh, I, I've got part three, which is the end of the trilogy uh, on the uh, it's it's in the writer's room now. There you go. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Comics for Life. Good question. It says, which Conan story would you say defines in some way your approach to your own work? Oof. Well, that's tricky. Um, if you can pinpoint such a story, I know that's really if you tough. Can pinpoint. Uh, well, all, all I can. Um, all I can pin back to is the the Iron. I think it's the Iron Moons. I can't. Really, I can never remember the title exactly. It's got Iron Moons in the title, um, and that's the one that I remember picking up as a as a, like a nine year old boy. I remember sitting on a boat with my mum and dad, and uh, my mum and dad were, were doing what they're doing. And I read through this comic at least five times the first time I got it. Um, I've got it here somewhere. I know it is here somewhere because I went out and rebought the book. I got, got it off eBay uh, just so that I could get it. Is it that one? No. <laughs> See how many I've picked up. <laughs> oh, man. I think it's those. I picked this one up as well That's because a it had. Great looking um, stack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it had um, uh, the, the uh, Worms of the Earth in it as well, which is something else that I'd kind of forgotten that I'd loved as a kid. And I, we were talking about it the other day on a show. And uh, I thought, oh, I've got to have that. So I just, I went out and got that from, from eBay. So um, it's here somewhere. I know it is. And I'm terrible with names. Sorry about that. Um, right, don't, don't worry about it. Don't, but, don't dig uh, up at all of it. That story, uh, it, it began with a, a serving girl being pursued through the reeds. Uh, and this, this bad guy had got her. And Conan had come across them. And he, 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 he did the, the quarter uh, thrust or whatever it is where it goes across your body and he, he called its name out while he did it and oh it was just it, just fantastic stuff and the art was by Alcala so it was Buscema with Alcala over the top and I just poured through it again and again and again it was just such a wonderful book um, there's there's a there's a piece in it where the demons have this uh, young lad uh, blonde lad and I st studied the rib cage on how the, the guy was was uh, pitched up against the, the piece of rock when he was when he was murdered by these guys. I'm only nine years old and I'm studying all this <laughs> stuff, um, but just everything about it, just uh, completely, uh, I was besotted with it for a while there, um, and that story hit me the hardest. But there are so many good stories. I I ended up getting because um, I wanted to get a whole bunch of Alcala stuff. Uh, I ended up getting this. Um, oh yeah, yeah, and that that actually had the title in it. 
of the one that I was looking for. Was there ever a Conan um, TV show? Was there ever a series? Uh, no, I don't think there was. That's so weird. You figure that uh, they would have jumped on that during the time of like yeah. Hercules and Xena and all that yeah, other stuff. I, I really like that Hercules series. <laughs> yeah, that's but just. I, uh, I like yeah. trash TV. You know, like I like trash films. Um, <laughs> I'm really, I'm very shallow. Um, so I, I like crappy movies and, you know, just stuff that's fun. I, I think that's that's why I love comics or. Certainly, why I used to love the old comics in the Bronze Age is everything was just so much fun. It, you, there was this, you know, you you went from one episode to the next, and there was a a rounded story, but there was like this story arc over a few uh, few issues, and you could follow that. And just, uh, just oh yeah, I remember the completely... animated the animated Conan series. I remember that. I liked there the was, uh, yes. yeah. I liked the theme song, but it could have been so much better. I don't, yeah, I don't remember the theme song. <laughs> There's something just like repeating his name. <laughs> uh, Conan, Conan, Conan. I only I only actually found out that there was an animated uh, series just a little while ago, and I saw it. For good, good lord, what the hell is that? But yeah, I've never actually seen it myself. Uh, Alejandro says good afternoon and says uh, Russ, I sent you a DM. Yes, I'll, I'll go find it. <laughs> Alejandro says that I uh, used to love Hercules and Xena, especially Xena. There was just a certain vibe about them. Yeah, I mean, you know, she was a big girl, but she was nice. <laughs> she could have overpowered me if she wanted. <laughs> so far, says uh, there was a Conan TV show with the German guy from the Gladiator movie. Really? Wow, I gotta wow. look that up. I gotta look that up. Yeah, I find so much of this episodic storytelling, this serialized storytelling, comics especially... I, I'm I'm so I don't want to see I I never thought I'd say it I don't want to see another comic book movie I'm done yeah. I'm burnt out yeah. but I want to see good serialized formats mm. of these things now I don't know if they're ever gonna exist anytime soon but there's so many of them that are done so well generally most of the animated type shows but yeah I I I think it just lends itself so much better to that. As opposed to the, this big movie sort of yeah. universe that keeps well, on getting the reason out of hand. The, the reason that those first ten years of Marvel worked was because it was so. It was those first few films, like the, the Captain America, the Thor film, and what have you. They were like those one-offs that you were like, "Wow, these are great." Um, and then they linked them all together through the Thanos story, and it kind of worked and so it was almost episodic in its in the way that it was done and then as soon as you got to end game it was like right i'm done now i i, I don't even know if i'd have if the films had been any good after that i don't know that i'd have gone back to see them because i felt like the story was finished yeah it's a curious it. title to say end game <laughs> yeah it's not the great marketing is it but <laughs> it's like all right you're all set you're all done now oh wait 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 we're not done we're not done Come back, come back. <laughs> and they're like, nah, that, we're good. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Alejandro is asking, would you be open to those shows coming back? You know how everything is being brought back with the same actors. How would you feel about that? And goes, I know what Pete is going to say. Ha ha. <laughs> how do you feel? What shows? I don't know. I, I guess oh. I guess whatever from uh, everything's just coming back again. And, yeah, and, and and not and I for a particular know. good reason. I'm 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 fed up with uh, people rebooting things, ruining stuff from the um, from the past. It's just it's annoying. Oh, oh he says Hercules and Xena. Uh, yeah, says. but they couldn't have the same actors, could they? <laughs> no, I don't think they could. <laughs> they uh they that wouldn't work. Um. And if they brought it back, it would just because it, you know, looking back on those, they were very hammy. They they were they were great fun. They were they were as shallow as I was, you know. They they were there wasn't epic storytelling. It was just good, you know, Sunday afternoon fun. Um, and I don't think they make shows like that anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, it's either got to un have a message or you know. Well, it's either unbelievably over the top uh, mm. melodrama to the point that it's almost like parody or satire mm. 
Yeah, yeah. And then there's quippy, nonsensical. You can't even get a story going because everyone has to get their one liner in every five mm. seconds. Yeah, and it's just it it destroys story. Oh, I don't know. Not. I, I, I wish they could make them again, but I know you're saying why not? They totally could. They could make them a little more serious and have them train the next generation of demigods or something. Write it, Eliandro. Write it. Yeah. <laughs> make See, it happen. With me, I mean, Hercules, I don't know, is, does Xena does tie into mythology or was that something made up? I can't recall. I, d I don't think, I d I'm not aware that Xena is actually some kind of mythological. It's got to be some kind of like Artemis and a couple other things yeah. put together. I, I think um, they made the, the Hercules journeys and then I think they just did a female version. I think that was all it was. But Yeah, because she was a, like a villain character in the Hercules show. Yeah, they kind right? of bought her in. And then she turned into yeah. like yeah, an yeah, anti-hero. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, I, I'm... And they don't do this a whole hell of a lot anymore, but I'm always more excited to see what's up that's that's new, even if yeah. it's inspired by the old, which is, that's everything that's ever been. <laughs> We're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. yeah. You know, just go for it. Mm. Yeah, make something new. Yeah, that's what I did with Only Death Could Save Us. I just came up with something new. Saying that, though, I'm, you know, I'm retelling a, a, a Robert E. Howard story. Although we're, we're making sure we're very faithful to the book. So the, there is a difference. It's not our version of it. It's an adaptation of it. Too. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. So has there ever been a comic adaptation of that story? Or is yes. this the only one? Yeah, there have. There have been several. I think Dark Horse did one. Marvel did one in, back in the day. Um, but uh, neither myself nor uh, Randy were overly impressed by them. Uh, Randy's a huge Robert E. Howard fan. Um, a big... Uh, adventure and pulp fan and um when we spoke about it we we came up with it simply it came out of a conversation and we realized that he knew that they're in public domain i didn't realize what was in public domain and what wasn't and as soon as i found out i said i want to do that so we did it <laughs> it was literally a spur of the moment thing because i'd found out that we could do it so i did it um and his uh, he's gone through the story and edited it raw and 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 then adapted the um the panel progression so that it works with the original text oh okay um and then in the book itself i think it's about 25 26 pages we've got the original story the original prose story in the book after the uh the graphic novel aspect of it so oh you fantastic get to, you get to read both you get a proper book you get to compare it to what we've done um and uh, we, we think we've been very faithful to it are you aware of the other interpretations? Uh, and... Yeah, I had a flick through one a little while ago. I didn't like the Dark Horse one particularly. I think they gave him a ponytail. Um, and um, the other one was, was older, and I've only seen a few pages of it, but uh, I, I didn't really like... After, after actually going through the script with Randy and understanding the story and drawing it myself, there were a couple of things, even in just a few pages, that kind of seemed glaring that shouldn't have been there. You know, oh, wow. where, they're, where they're making an adaptation for a comic book and, and they're not. They're just retelling the story and adding their own bits into it. Whereas, like I say, we, we adapted it faithfully. Very nice. Yeah, that, that's that's something that's interesting to me about public domain is that you can a lot of the time lift the characters, even the stories and, and have your own thing there or even reprint them, too. Mm. But in certain cases, like uh, Conan the Barbarian and a couple other characters, you can't put them in the title. No. You can't mention, what, yeah. yeah. That's what Ablaze did in Europe. Um, they did a whole bunch of Conan stuff, and they didn't put Conan on the cover. They put the Sumerian on the cover. Um, Titan are doing Conan at the moment with uh, Torre and a couple other artists. Is it Braithwaite? Um, they're doing a grand job, really good stuff, really like what they're doing. They're also doing a Savage Sword of Conan, which is mm. a black and white uh, uh, bi-monthly. Um, and effectively, that's what we want to do. So we're bringing out the uh, the Shadow Kingdom. We're giving it a... We're making it in colour, and we're giving it kind of like a 70s, 80s, Bronze Age retro colour palette uh, so that it's got that look of those comics at the time, so the, the, the Buscema Savage Sword of Conan monthlies. 
but we will want to do going forward I want to do a 48 page black and white book oh okay uh, quarterly <laughs> let's see but I'd love to do it quarterly and that would be my thing and I'd get a painted cover for every issue just like oh, man. The magazines and do black and white internally so that's something I'm I'm aiming towards when I've got well, the only death I can save is three I've got a, obviously we've got an issue with yourself um, and I've got a, another couple of bits and pieces I've got to do for other people once that's out the way then that's what I want to do so uh, they should be turning up next year oh nice are you going to do everything on that I'll probably end up doing everything uh, Randy will write it but we've already we've already possibly lined up a couple of guest writers as well so the idea would be that we take Cull as a public domain character, his his uh, friend, his warrior friend, Brawl, who you'll see in the book. And the when you read it to the end of the book, you realise that it's like this is the, it's like this is the, um, uh, what did they used to, they used to do like a, a single episode, didn't they? Like a, a pilot, pilot. You mm. can look at this almost like a pilot for a series, okay? Because at the end of the book, it's basically saying, and next comes this so it's a full story but it sets you up and what we'd like to do is kind of like a road trip where Cull, oh, okay. Cull goes out but not as the king he goes out as like he's in disguise almost it's just in ordinary clothes with brawl and they're on the road looking for the lizard people of the shadow kingdom um, oh, we've already got nice. a couple of extra characters that we've created and whoever writes it will write it with an eye on how robert e howard envisaged the characters so we won't just go off into La La Land. It'll have a lot of respect, deep respect for for Robert e. Howard's characters. And we want to do this road trip with it, and it will be called the Atlantean. And that's uh, that's something, that's where I want to go with it. Uh, but I've just got a few other jobs to kick out first. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, now I want to start asking you about other things. Oh. In terms of Atlantis, how interested are you in that subject? How uh, well-versed? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've listened to a lot of Graham Hancock, um, and uh, who's the other guy? Um, the guy. You're thinking of Randall well. Carlson. Randall Carlson, that's it. That's the guy. Um, I have a lot of time for the idea that there have been or was a civilization prior to the Ice Age, and that uh, for one reason or another, natural disasters. It, it was taken out and that uh, aspects of that culture have come through into Sumerian, Egyptian, whatever cultures around the world. It, it makes total sense to me. Um, uh, I, I don't see... How, I, it, it's, it's a little disturbing to see how a theory can be shot down so, so nastily. Well, especially where the, there's like uh, hundreds of sunken cities. Yeah, exactly, and it seems it does. It does sometimes make you think, you know, what, why are they why are they not allowing us to at least investigate a, a theory like this? But things keep getting older. They keep finding more archaeological sites. They, you know, uh, Gebekli Tepe is like what eleven, twelve thousand years old. It was buried on purpose, and you know, hunter gatherers don't just turn up one day and go. Let's put all these things together. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I listen to a lot of that stuff. I, I really enjoy that. Um, I think we don't know anywhere near what we think we know, put it that way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, and even if uh, Atlantis in and of itself was not a real living mm. city mm. and it was a myth and an amalgamation of what was there combined with a bit of like a cautionary mm. tale that like this is something that we need to remember it's, it's like every story it's ever been conceived it's important that we remember these events yeah and what is transcribed here and we need to make sure it carries on yeah definitely you know yeah and, I, I think uh, i think atlantis was more likely a um a, a coastline culture uh, or, or or civilization rather than one city um and let's face it every every religion every mythology has a massive flood in it and uh, there's now proof of such a flood um archaeological proof so yeah. you know or geological proof should i say not archaeological um so you know it, it kind of makes sense that 
we don't know everything. We were around for at least at least a hundred thousand years before uh, recorded history. So what are we doing? Just sitting around picking our nose? I, I don't know. You know, we were all anatomically exactly the same a hundred to a hundred and fifty thousand years ago. Oh yeah, yeah. I think it's you know, something now it's, as far back as like two hundred fifty thousand years exactly, in terms yeah, of you know, yeah, yeah. like They're, they don't know a whole hell of a lot of what happened no. a bit before that of how all of a sudden it was just this great evolutionary leap yeah, yeah. but in so, terms of what they're finding it's pretty much yeah anatomically yeah. correct humans is the same thing everything's getting older um every time they look they, they find things that are older i mean and you don't gonna have to go down some mystical um or or alien uh you know rabbit holes it's just humans have had civilization and it's died away and and i think what graham hancock talks about is the fact that it possibly could have been comet remnants of this comet path that we go around every year we go through it every year and it's something that you might think well maybe we should be a little bit more careful maybe we should be vigilant because maybe it caught us out once before um, and just ignoring these things and you know throwing them away means that you might be missing something quite important absolutely but we all know about the fact that nobody wants to look at history anymore well, history is uh, messy and uncomfortable. It is. And uh, and muddy. <laughs> <laughs> In more ways than one. And uh, yeah, Shrek. Shrek says they are investigating. The proof is they're finding new things, uh, mm-hmm. new old things all the time. Yeah, and that's what's great. Is is And that's what's so odd. I, mean, I guess it's always been this way in terms of you get the people within certain paradigms set up it could be science religion government culture you could go and pick any paradigm that's been established and people like the way it is Mm. um so with archaeology with with something like atlantis and all of these sunken cities and lost civilizations and everything uh it's it's far more convenient to Mm. just say it's the stuff of storybooks and legend and it is to acknowledge that this existed. Yeah. And if, if you start going down that path, and there's always going to be people that are like, no, no, it did, and we're going to try to investigate and look for it. But the established system is going to really fight back on that, yeah. and they do that a lot. Um, but at the same time, I mean, people like something to, to, to go up against, to have that counterculture, yeah. kind of like what we were talking about in the beginning. So it yeah. fuels further... <laughs> investigation and uh, and theories and proliferation yeah. of such as it, as it should yeah Co- comfortable yeah. consensus is the enemy of progress you know absolutely it, it doesn't doesn't help you i mean all you got to do is look at what the jwst is doing at the moment the, the big uh, infrared telescope or whatever it is they got up there and they're finding things that are older and older and older and it's just not making sense with the big bang theory and you know the the, the current cosmology and all they keep on doing is kind of retrofitting fixes to their cosmology ideas instead of taking a step back and going, well, maybe we got this wrong. And it's the same with archaeology, uh, although archaeology isn't a science. Um, not in my view, anyway. Um, it's it, People won't step back and go, maybe we got this wrong. Let's have another look because they're comfortable in their consensus. So yeah yeah and that's the interesting part about all of this is because uh what are the implications what are the implications for advanced civilization that has been lost to time that was thousands of years older than we possibly thought they could have been Hmm. you know and maybe i'm not saying it's aliens i'm not saying there's aliens (laughs) but maybe you go back (laughs) far enough and it's aliens (laughs) yeah yeah i don't yeah could be could be (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, because that's all I could think. Even as a kid, I was like, okay, so the dinosaurs died like 65 million years ago because something hit the planet so hard it ended up, you know, killing them, uh, creating everything that was to come. The first massive, as far as we know, ice age that was an extinction level event. But they were around for like millions upon millions of years even before that. But yeah, quick, so, 250 million years or something, oh, or, or yeah. 150 million years. And they years. never evolved time. to talk. I mean, you got to tell me that they, they, they it's got to be like the Jim Henson, or well, yeah. he had passed at that time, but the Jim Henson studio, Dinosaurs. Yeah, you know, yeah, I love yeah. that show. Yeah, that was funny. Talking about <laughs> guilty pleasures, you know. And uh, so it's just, it's it's interesting to me to see how much of a large span of time there is. 
mm. between the dinosaurs allegedly dying. I'm going to have to use the word allegedly because I, quite frankly, don't really know. We have good guesses. <laughs> These are good guesses. 65 million or so years ago. And then human beings kind of showing up roughly 250, we'll even say 300,000 years ago, anatomically correct human beings. Mm. You know, there's a lot of time that goes. Big, and and yeah. nothing else has apparently evolved to the point that human beings have evolved to. If evolution no, is about achieving yeah. like the pinnacle of what you should be, yeah, everything else He's is at the pinnacle of where it should be, and humans are there too, but nothing yeah. else is just like a human. That's These vast, puzzling to me. The vast periods of time, um, you know, if we, if our civilization, if, if all the humans on the on the planet were to be taken off it immediately tomorrow, um, it would be what a thousand years, and you wouldn't know we'd been here. So, if something was around for several million years, in the the, the distance, you know, sixty between that sixty five million year gap, how would we know they'd been and gone? We wouldn't. As, I think that's called the Silurian um, uh, theory. The Silurian Silurian theory, something like that. Mm. Um, my, named after the, the the Silurians on Doctor Who, apparently. But there you go. Wow! Not the other way around. No, no. Apparently, it was named after that. Yeah, that's what they, that's what they applied to. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, there's been a bunch of ice ages, mm. you know, and the, the, the latest one we're talking about is that antediluvian period, you know, roughly, what is that? Like 12,000 12, or so 11, years ago. Yeah. 11,000 or 10, 10, 11,000 years ago. And there give was, or take there was a thousand two, years. There was an ice age that was, that was starting to wind down. Uh, and then you had the younger Dryas, which is like this mini ice age. And that's the one that they suggest where pieces of a comet may have hit the earth. And so you had this massive flood uh, wall that, that went right the way around the planet. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all wacky stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, Silvar, I agree. I agree. It's it's just kind of the thing that uh, that I was told as a, as a kid in school about mm. evolution. And I think that's the thing that confuses a lot of people, too, is because you can see evolution take place. You can see parents pass traits down to children. Mm. That's... A, oh, it's this very very small form of evolution and it happens over a long period of time and you get what you get but evolution in and of itself is usually a very 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 long long thing it takes a it's very also, long time yeah it's also very odd i mean they've been now that they can look into how cells work i mean the machinery that goes on inside a cell a living cell is utterly bananas they've got these things that wander around with with literally with rotor blades on the back um, oh yeah they, they have like these buses that take pairs of of whatever these things are, i don't know chromosomes whatever in into one place and then out to another and when they finish they kind of go on holiday and stuff and <laughs> yeah it's, it's the just, craziest technology you've ever yeah, seen <laughs> it's, it's mad absolutely mad and you think how on earth did that evolve that's kind of crazy that's, and then, yeah, yeah, you put them all together with certain, and they, they form organs. You put the organs, and then they form systems, and then they form mm -hmm. a, a body and a living entity. And then that thing cooperates or, or at least operates mm -hmm. independently from all, all the other things that are going on. It's no, mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling. Don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the stuff of it's the stuff of amazing storytelling at the very yes. least yes and yes. uh that's the thing that i think is so fascinating is because we're all just taking a, a good guess at everything yeah. i think if we can at least acknowledge that we're all yeah, just like you yeah. know because even the evidence because people go science is about evidence i get it mm. yes science is about evidence until that evidence is obsolete because new evidence has come along that's right so yeah. you know it's yeah. never like this set in stone crystallized thing yeah, I, I find listening to some scientists, they can be incredibly uh, arrogant uh, about their theories being, well, that's it. It's all ended now. We know what we're doing. We, you know, yeah, the, like, yeah it's just, and it's a good mindset, I think, to have that uh, the, the open-mindedness to possibility, but also the understanding that it's okay if you acknowledge the unknown makes you terribly frightened <laughs> yeah uh, well yeah i mean the whole point is the best way to live your life is living with uncertainty that's how you know it's, it's not about what happens to you it's about how you deal with it exactly um, and if you have that approach to everything if you have that approach to science and to 
society and culture, it means that we can all get along. You know, we can all rub along because you never know what's coming around the corner. Might be absolutely a meteorite tomorrow. I don't know. Yeah, acknowledge the fear, and then yeah. overcome the fear through rationalization yeah. and understanding that it's not as scary as it might have first seemed to be. That's the one. And yeah, you know, it's just that, that's like water. Yeah, that's life. You know. But uh, that's that's the thing. There's a lot of people that, that let fear guide every decision, mm. their whole life, their whole path of life, and it's so unfortunate that that happens. And everyone just needs a big hug, you know. Get someone, get get good friendships and, and establish connections with people or, or animal friends if, if people mm. aren't your thing, you know. And and just give them a good hug. Yeah. Hug every time. It's <laughs> nice. So I want to take a quick look here at your campaign before we uh, before we wrap things up. This it's always great talking to you, Russ. Seriously. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always a good chat. So you got the Shadow Kingdom. I'm going to put this link here in the chat for those that want to peruse. Now it's also in the description of the show if you guys want to check it out. Uh, uh, got, it's a fun my comic, so you, you much like the others, you need to set up a profile. Um, and then once you set up a profile, then you can, then you can back a book. There you go. So you got 66 backers. This has been, uh, going on since March 1st uh -huh. and you're at 2856 of the $5,000 goal. Yeah. Yeah. It's not bad. We're pretty, pretty pleased with that. So yeah. That's why getting there. So you got 110 pages in the story. Like you said, uh -huh. you got 69 pages are, is the comic. And then you've got the original book there the original story by robert e howard printed in the book then i've got some more art in the back um some special stuff that i'm producing at the moment uh all the artworks available to buy as well so very nice and this is a hardcover book uh no this is a soft cover uh that we tried to what i wanted to do was put this out as a like i say we, we did the retro color so make it a color graphic novel Keep okay. It as as low price as possible, um, get it out to people, and then what we'd like to do at some point is a hardback, uh, like artisan version, where you can see the actual inks, um, and uh, uh, and hopefully it'd be a nice collector's piece. Very nice, very nice. So, are you doing all the art on this? You're doing the the colors yeah. as well. Yeah, I did the art and the colors. Every, everything's done. Very good. So it's, Look it's ready this. to go to print as soon as we finish the campaign. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, here's the original art. Pen and ink. Man. This is great. Yeah, I've got some here. Oh, oh, let's see it. There's a page. There you go, you can see that. So it's actually got the chapter written. The chapter oh, breaks man. are written on the, on, on the artwork. Uh... Oh, there you go. There. There's the cover. Oh, look at that. That's great. So, yeah, it's all original artwork, uh, all available to buy. Um, and, um, like I say, it's all, it's all completely finished, ready to go. Wow. Fantastic. Holy smokes. Man, oh, man, oh, man got some um, okay, I just uh, I'll show you this I've got some stuff you can have a, a, a look at just for just for you just for you and your audience Ooh, okay I That's like the sound of that share that for you let's see here what do we got very nice there you go so that's the cover that's the uh, cover yeah yeah that's that's now been you know uh, filtered so it's solid black um, but that this is like some of the, the artwork from in there. So you can That's see what it, what it looks like. Um, and it's like I said, this is all pen and ink brush, pen ink brush. How it's tight is the, the script in terms of you following yeah, what's was, on there? Because, because we were, we were, you know, trying to be as close as possible. It was fairly tight. Um, but then, you know, with these pages that I'm showing here, they're like, um, 
they're like memory pages. So uh, Brule is telling Cull about the the wars in, in in throughout history, and Cull is remembering like the soul, uh, his own soul's journey, and, and that kind of stuff. And so where uh, Randy had said maybe we can have two panels, I made them into single page ensembles. Um, uh, and so they're they've they've come out quite nice. I think they've come out okay. Yeah. Um, and there you go. Like everything's lettered and done, uh, coloured up, finished. There's there's another one of those pages with a bit of a Cthulhu thing going on in there. Uh, Man, a that's great. Page out. This is where the city is talking to him, uh, which is a lovely scene of him um, going back through the city after he's uh, visited a, a guy called Kanu. So this is like an, an open section where they, they talk about the... He, he gives him the information, but he doesn't actually tell him about the lizard people. And then Brawl comes to him that night and they, they, they find out the whole secret about what's going on. So there you go. That's great. Very nice, man. So, so again, if you guys really, haven't had a chance, check it out. It's on Fund My Comic. We're, we're really very proud of it. I think it's the best work I've done. Um, coming up, probably the next best work will be for you. <laughs> That's what um, I like to hear. I'm really, really looking forward to doing that with you. Really looking forward to doing that. That one image you had right at the start of the stream, that was a lovely image of King Cryptid. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the back cover to issue six. Uh, Preston yeah. Azevedo did that. Oh, well, there you go. Preston did it, right? Yeah, it's beautiful yeah. stuff. Gorgeous. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know, we're really pleased, really proud of it, and um, like I say, I I I really want it to do well so that I can move on and do more, because I I'd, I'd really like to take Carl out on the road and do the Atlantean next year, uh, but um, we've got a couple of projects just to get off the off the the board in the meantime. Do you mind if I uh, do you mind if I share the sketch that you did of King Cryptid? No, no, because I love it. I haven't even shared this at all yet with anyone. So do you guys in the chat want to see that? Because he's going to be drawing. I'll break it down. So uh, Russ is going to be drawing King Cryptid number 12. That's going to be on the upcoming campaign in the fall uh, after this one fulfills for five to nine. Uh, and Alex Jovich, who's been doing the art on issue three and issue eight, is going to be doing the colors for this issue. But uh, issue 12 is about Santa Claus getting kidnapped by Krampus. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and Krampus is, uh, he's got traps set for King Cryptid. He's using Santa as bait because he's got a beef to settle with King Cryptid and Santa and figures might as well take out both if he can at the same time. And this is happening on the night of Christmas Eve. Santa's on his way, Krampus gets him, and King Cryptid's got to find Santa with the help of Santa's reindeer. It's a nice Christmas episode. I can't wait. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. <laughs> so watch King Cryptid save Christmas. Or maybe he doesn't. Maybe Santa gets it. Who knows? But uh, I can't wait to see Russ draw that. Yeah, and uh, so here, here is the sketch. I, I absolutely love it. Here's the sketch of uh, Russ Leach's version of King Cryptid. It's fantastic. It's such a great character. It's, it's really fun to draw as well. Yeah, you got the physicality of him. I love that you got like the, the proportions. You got the body with the fur. You've got his stature. You've got his, uh, his animality mm. that he's got as well. He can be a bit of a, he can be a, bit of a tough cookie at times. Yeah. Looking forward to inking it, actually. I've, oh, I've yeah. totally fallen in love with traditional inking because uh, I used to do everything digital, um, which is a, was a long story. <laughs> but uh, but I, I decided on the first Only Death Can Save Us that I wanted to have some original art to sell to people because, you know, it helps the campaign. And um, I did a few and was completely, completely fell in love with it. Up until that point, I was scared shitless of it to be honest oh um, no way yeah yeah completely scared of it. i was like you know like 
getting grimy with with the inks and the fact that it is like it's one and done okay you've got some white out but you've got to get it right yeah yeah uh, and uh but but now i'm absolutely completely enamored with with inking so can't wait to do do this Oh yeah, I can't wait to see you bring this to life. This is going to be a lot of fun, and uh, just the story alone, I can't wait to see you drawing Krampus, and you got uh, Santa's reindeer involved, you know, and they're cryptids, Santa's reindeer, so he's able ah. to telepathically communicate with them. Cool. You know. How is is Santa going to be like a like um uh what was that Christmas at Halloween uh with the jack the jack thing oh the nightmare before nightmare before christmas, christmas. is he gonna be like round and tubby or is he gonna be more no sweet? he's gonna be like uh like a like norse god-ish you know Stop. yeah <laughs> where it's like <laughs> bulky muscle you know i was now, thinking like, of um, tubby more 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 terry pratchett than uh than, <laughs> than that you know like he's sort of a a, a, like you say, a Norse king warrior kind of look. To yeah. Him, yeah. Big beard. Chunky. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Exactly. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> he he looks tough, but there's kindness in his eyes. You know that yes. kind of a thing. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, because you gotta be you're living up there in the North Pole. You gotta be tough. It's cold. Yeah. I saw that um, one with um, oh with Mad Max in it. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. Was it called Bad? I can't remember what it's called. Bad Man or something like that. Oh, it was, basically... was that uh, with Mel Gibson, right? Mel Gibson. That's the man. That's the man. The very man. Yeah. Um, and he was Santa, and he was some kind of mystical being. Oh, sorry. I don't want to. Don't want to ruin it if nobody's seen it. But it's a very funny film. It's very good. He's very good in it. So uh, I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, yeah, I like, uh, I love Christmas, I love everything about it, I love uh, the colors, I love the the myth of uh, of Santa and everything, so I figure, why not, let's, let's put Santa in this world, and yeah. Grampus is such an interesting character as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, very good. Because they were yeah. kind of like teammates, like Krampus would go out and punish the bad, and Santa would go out and, you know, give the, 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 the fruit and the chocolates to the good. And uh, it'll be explained. There's a bit of a falling out that's occurred over the years. <laughs> Good stuff. More, <laughs> more Kenny Loggins than John Candy. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like if you merged them. <laughs> if you merge them and then they, they hit the gym for a year. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's the uh, Dr. Masters. Will Rudolph make an appearance or is that copywritten? I'm not going to have Rudolph in it, but uh, but I don't know if uh, if I'd be allowed to or not. So yeah, mm, yeah I don't sure. I don't yeah I'm not entirely sure, but yeah that'll be a really fun, really yeah, fun issue. Cool that. Cool. Yeah. So get ready, get ready for that. That's going to be good. But uh, until then, go check out the Shadow Kingdom. That'll tide you over until King Cryptid issue 12, and anything else that Russ has coming up. Uh, the link, again, is in the description of the show. Before we go, where can they find you, Russ? You can find me at russleach.com. That's it. Oh, every, every network connection you need is there. I'm on Instagram and all the usual places, Twitter and what have you. But russleach.com. And if you can, sign up for the email list, and I can keep you abreast of any new projects that are coming. There you go. All right. Everybody, thank you guys for being here for this midday special. Yes. on uh, Comic Book Radio. And I hope you guys all have a wonderful night. And I'm going to be on the Alterna channel this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, 9 o'clock Eastern, with Rob Geronimo, Tyler Wentland, and Keir Covington. We're going to be having an Alterna art auction. I've got art. I actually have art this time. Cool. I haven't had <laughs> art for like the past two or three months. <laughs> Just been too busy. I'm finding the time to get in there, draw some stuff. I've been inspired by Rob Geronimo's Blood Realm campaign, which is doing so great. It's almost 50% of the way there within the first 24 hours. Great books. Thank you, guys. Yeah, we had a launch stream for that last night. Tremendous. Thank you guys so much. If, if you guys are in here and you backed last night or, or today, or you're going to back soon, um, thank you guys so much for your support on that. Rob is a great dude, and it's a fantastic book. 
Uh, but yeah, we'll be doing that this weekend. And uh, other than that, I'll see you guys on this channel Tuesday. I can't see who's going to be here Tuesday because I have a marker on the calendar, like over there, and it's <laughs> blocking. <laughs> I'll be here Tuesday, though, at 10 o'clock at night Eastern with someone. Someone. I'll be here with someone <laughs> on Tuesday night. Until then, I'll see you guys hopefully this weekend. Uh, everybody have a wonderful evening. Russ, thank you so much. Great thank conversation. You for, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me on. Thanks to the chat. So. Oh, man. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and until then, everybody have a great night and an even better tomorrow. That's I'll see done. you guys soon. All the best.